to welcome everyone here to our service today. We're going to open up our service with a word of prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you today. God, and we thank you for this time that we got to come together, God, and celebrate the life of this dear sister here today. God, I pray that you be with this family during this time. God, bring comfort and peace, God, in these times. God, I also pray that you bring joy. God, let this service go well, God, and touch everything that is spoken and blessed. And we love you and we thank you today. In your most holy name we pray. Amen and amen. I tell you, I never thought I'd stand up here. <laughs> um, when we did Daddy's service, I didn't speak. And I don't know why, but that has just really haunted me. So I would like to share a couple of thoughts and a story with y'all about Mama and Daddy to send them off. <clears throat> when my Daddy was a little boy, he used to pretend he was a car and scoot around in the dirt. The worn-out knees on his jeans were headlights, the holes in his seat were taillights. In fact, he re rubbed red clay on the bare spots on his rear end to enhance the effect. When he was seven years old, he met a little girl on the playground. Her name was Lucy, and Daddy fell head over heels in love. He raced home that evening and asked his mama to sew patches on his jeans. He had met the girl he was going to marry, and he was embarrassed that she could see his little red rear end. Mama and Daddy were friends for years. But when she was 15, she married another man. Daddy suffered in silent misery until he was old enough to enlist in the Coast Guard, lying about his age to get in a year early. He served as a demolition diver and liked the work, but always had a problem with authority. A little physical altercation with a superior officer landed him in the brig in New Orleans in 1945. The Coast Guard, however, was more interested in a deal than charges. If Daddy would re-enlist, and continue blowing up wrecks, he would be forgiven. He was about to take the offer when Uncle Percy came to him and said, Lucille is getting a divorce. Daddy couldn't get back to Tampa fast enough. <laughs> when he finally got to take Mama on a date, she kissed him goodnight wearing bright red Max Factor lipstick, the color that was so popular back then. The smooch left an embarrassingly bold stamp on his cheek. Mama handed Daddy her delicate handkerchief to clean up, but instead of wiping, he pressed the cloth to his skin. The lipstick was thick enough to leave behind a perfect impression of Mama's lips. Daddy kept that handkerchief in a box and looked at it often over the next several decades. He always smiled when he held it, and we have it to this day. Mama's life, though, was something less than a sappy Hallmark romance. She didn't exactly come through the Depression unscathed. Her father was an abusive alcoholic who couldn't hold a job. Later on, she married a mechanic, a good man who, though happy with his profession, never made a lot of money. He and Mama did make a big family, though, six of us. Consequently, she scrimped and saved and worried about paying bills her whole life. Yet we always seemed to have what we needed. I remember they got me a rockin' stereo for my 15th birthday, a pretty little brass bed for my 16th birthday, and when I went away to UNC, they gave me a sleek electric typewriter. As I contemplate the legacy my parents have left with me, I realize Mama was truly the toughest person I've ever known. In her lifetime, she buried three of her children. I told her once I truly respected her because she never let those tragedies turn her to drugs or alcohol. She merely soldiered on. She is the reason I don't write whiny, soft heroines. Daddy showed me it was okay to love with gushy, sentimental abandon. Mama showed me how to dig for that pragmatic self-control when you need it. Daddy always told me I could do anything I put my mind to. Mama never said a word, just gave me the tools to do what I put my mind to. Daddy lived life with unbridled, unsinkable hope. Mama gritted her teeth and prayed for the strength to keep hope alive. Daddy saw only the best in people. Mama reminded me of reality, wisely tempering my expectations of people. They both embodied my favorite saying, never give in, never back down, never lose faith. I have so many fine memories of them playing cards with Ellie and Irene, shooting the breeze with Martha and Shorty, and letting, letting, letting us take over their house at Christmas. Mama and Daddy laughed often, held their friends and family close, and truly treasured every moment with us. I never doubted their love. 
While death eventually comes for us all, it need only be an interruption, not a permanent separation, especially if you know the one who gives everlasting life. And I know they did. Thank you. Stormy, thank you so much. That was beautiful. We, we actually could close the service and go home. She's embodied who they were as a couple. You know, um, I'm going to ask Pastor Ralph to come in a minute, but, but Grandma and Grandpa, you know, the term that always comes to mind, and we can't have a service for Grandma without talking about Grandpa. We're going to do that today and, and honor both of their memories. But the term that comes to my mind is salt of the earth. These are the kind of folks that made this country what it is today. I talked about it with, with, with our family last uh, Sunday, a couple Sundays ago at the decoration. This, this generation of people in particular, uh, I said, were the greatest generation of Americans in the greatest country that's ever existed in the history of mankind. And they made it. What, it, what it is today, what we have, the freedom, the liberty, the hope that we have, the prosperity that we have as a nation is because of people like Buddy and Lucy Fry. And I'm so proud uh, that, that I'm a part of their family. You know, they, um, Grandma so many times felt like she wasn't good enough and that Papa wasn't good enough. Or wasn't dressed nice enough, right? Can we agree on that? <laughs> she felt the pressure of people's expectations. But I'm telling you, these were the kind of folks that we all should look to and say, hey, don't doesn't matter what they had or didn't have. They had each other. They had their families. And what was important to them was the right stuff, the important things. Those were the priorities. And, and I hope that I've learned those lessons and that I can pass those lessons on to my children. But I, I appreciate those stories. You know, a, another generation removed, we don't get all that history. And uh, it's so, so neat. To, to, that story about Grandpa, I mean, him starting in the dirt, perfect, right? Papa Buddy was dirty from the day that I knew him. You know, because he was working on Volkswagens and, and mechanical. And, you know, he, he, was just, he was just a mechanic. That's who he was, a cowboy, pistol-wielding mechanic. I strangely <laughs> enough, you know, that's the combination that we had. But, but so special, and I miss him so. And, and I know we're going to miss Grandma, but we want to celebrate her life today. I was thinking about it. Grandma, you know, some people, um, and, I, and I feel like, you know, personally, if I were to go, I don't want a lot of fanfare. You know, I'll be, I won't be here. I'll be with my Jesus and my family that's gone before me, and I don't require a lot of fan. Grandma would want fanfare. <laughs> Let's be honest. She'd want us to make a fuss, so I want to make a fuss today. I want to be here, and I want to enjoy this time, and let's celebrate her life together. I have asked um, Pastor Ralph Campbell from uh, Glenville, Glenville Wesleyan Church to come and share. He, he got to know Grandma a little bit, and I'm sure that he will uh, share that with you going forward because he's the chaplain at the nursing home uh, as well. And uh, he's a good man. He's a good man. I'm, I'm proud to have him with us today. Pastor Ray. Thank you, Nathan. Although um, certainly uh, talking about um, following up, following those two stories is going to be kind of difficult. But um, good afternoon. It is good to be here with you, and, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to be a part of a celebration that uh, I agree with is, uh, is a celebration of life. Uh, we come to this today, of course, to, uh, to celebrate the life of, of Miss Lucy. 91 years. Wow. Uh, that's, that's a good life, you know. And um, um, Lucy was certainly one that has touched a, a whole lot of lives. You know, the more I got to know her, when I first met her, in other words, Lucy was certainly one of those people that uh, I kind of just immediately uh, took on the persona that, that she had just been this, um, you know, perfect, um, God-fearing woman all of her life. <laughs> and then as I got to, to talking with her and got to talking to the family and, and realized that, uh, like most of us, she had gone through some, some rather tough times and uh, uh, had gone through some trying times and even some trying times in life. But I still say she ended up life exactly where I thought, always thought she was. She ended up life as this uh, matriarchal uh, person that, 
that had endured. And uh, when she really got down to business with Jesus Christ, she got down to business with Jesus Christ. And uh, I can appreciate that. I, uh, I had told Miss Lucy one time when we were actually sitting in the dining room together, and, um, uh, and she was... Uh, she had kind of given given me a little bit, and one of the others, she had given them kind of what for uh, about something, and I know you all find that unusual, but, you know. And uh, and so I said, Miss Lucy, I said, you just remind me so much of my mom. And she immediately looked up and she said, well, she must have been a good woman. I said, yes, I said, in fact, she was. She was a, a quite a, quite a woman. And she said, well, what reminds you? And I said, well, I said, my mom, too, de- never had a problem telling anybody, didn't have to be somebody she knew, um, what was what. And I said, she could set you straight even if she was standing in the middle of Walmart. Uh, but, um, but I said, and you kind of have that, uh, that about you. But I said, it's also the fact that I said, I said, I love uh, one of the, your characteristics is, is that I said, when, when I come to you and say something about let's pray, I said, uh, you don't hesitate. You just start praying. You know, I said, you're not waiting for me just to pray. I said, you just jump right in and start praying. Uh, her smiling face was just a part of us. And I tell people all the time as I, as I speak about the residents at the, at the uh, nursing home, and Willene, of course, is, uh, knows this very firsthand, uh, they become a part of us, and we become a part of them. Uh, we, we kind of get adopted into the family, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, you know, we, uh, we appreciate the fact that we get to know you all. And uh, we were sharing a, bit, a little bit last night uh, when you, you know, when you, you come around, uh, especially th- those such as Miss Lucy's family that come, came, comes around very often, we, uh, we do get to kind of know you and know what's going on in your life. And, and it's not unusual uh, now, for instance, that, you know, I have friends on, uh, you know, Facebook. I can't say Facebook sure. in here, right? Okay, but anyway, they, we have, I have friends on Facebook that I've met through the nursing home, uh, family members that, you know, share pictures of, you know, their new children and new babies and so forth like that. And uh, so we, we do appreciate that. Um, as I shared, you know, um, even last night, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, one of the endearing qualities of, of uh, Lucy Frey was that she, uh, she just kind of lit up a room when she came in. She always had this smile on her face. And uh, she would come to uh, some of our gatherings if we, if we could talk her into it. There were times that she, you know, she didn't. But uh, she'd come to some of the services. She enjoyed the, the, uh, the church services. She enjoyed the music services uh, especially. And, uh, and she would come. Uh, I have a once a week uh, chaplain's chat which is a uh, devotional Bible study kind of time together. And, uh, and she did not come to all of them, but she would come to a lot of times. And, uh, and she could, I could tell she would, sometimes she was really intently uh, into it and, uh, and, and listening. But, you know, we also come together, we celebrate, we also come together and mourn uh, because we're going to miss her, you know. I can tell you, even from our time, um, walking in, uh, you know, to the, the, the dining room or walking in, you know, to the activities department at any given time um, in the next few days, uh, there'll be an absence, you know, because I'm used to seeing that smiling face. And, uh, and most of the time, it not only was a smiling face, but it was also, it was also a motion, you know, it would be that motion. Come here, come here, you know. And uh, she would have some great tidbit of wisdom she wanted to share with me. Uh, and I appreciate that. Um, so, even though we will miss her and even though we, we do mourn, we, of course, are really celebrate the, the, the uh, life that God's allowed us to ha- share in. And the Bible says, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I believe that that's a truth that God gives us. Uh, you can, if you can imagine with me one of the things that um, I've kind of come to understand in, in reading a little bit about her, and I always find out, more, even though I tell families, I'm like, you know, I, it, it's hard to say this in a, in, in a better way, but I've, I've told families, I'm like, you know, if somehow or another you could write your uh, mother, grandmother, whatever, you could write their epitaph now while they're still living because I find out so much about them, you know, later on after they've passed away, and I'm like, oh, man, I would have loved to have gotten into a conversation like that. And to find out that Lucy's, one of Lucy's great loves was bowling, 
Uh, and I'm like, wow, I mean, could that have ever been fun, okay? Uh, because we actually would have taken the, uh, the residents bowling on occasion. But I had this picture, okay, as I was thinking more uh, yesterday uh, a little bit about this, and I said, you know, because I really believe in heaven. I believe heaven is just a fantastic, awesome, wonderful place, and I believe it's a place of activity. I don't believe that, that you know, we go to heaven and we sit around on a curb with wings on our back and flap the wings all day long, you know. Uh, I, I believe that heaven is a real place. And so, uh, and I also believe, have a, have a strong belief that, that, you know, Jesus gave, went to the cr- cross and died for us, okay? He went to the trouble to go to the cross and die for us, okay? Uh, he also said to us, he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. So I tell people, and, and, and I do deal with a good bit of death in a, in a nursing home in the, what we call the final transition of life. And, uh, but so I tell people all the time, I say, you know, we get all these images of, of, uh, of, of dying and what dying is like. I'm like, you know, there's nothing scary about it because I believe Jesus is the one that comes to get you, okay? I mean, he's done everything else. Do you really think he's going to send an assistant to pick you up when your time comes? So I believe he comes to get you. But I think there's also some of those cute kind of things. You know, I did a funeral just this past Sunday evening for a gentleman who, who was an avid, avid train lover. And I told him, I said, you know, I can just see Jesus now dressed up like a conductor when he come to get Warren and, uh, and looked at him and said, all aboard, you know. Well, I can just see Jesus whispering to Miss Lucy and saying, the team's waiting on you, and then handing her her favorite bowling ball. Can you imagine her bowling with a brand spanking new arm? You know, that new body, that glorified body. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says, The eternal God is our dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. In short, I believe that we are not alone uh, this afternoon, but that God himself is here with us. He loves these celebrations. He's told us in his word, he says, celebrate the passing of the saints. Why? Because you know what that really means is, is that that means they've gone home. And today, for the first time ever, Lucy Frey is alive. I think we have that life thing kind of turned around. You know, we think when we're born, no. It's when we go home. That's when we're alive. And we're fully alive so as we take this moment of turning to God allowing him to comfort us in our memories take a moment and say Lucy I'll see you soon at home thank you very much God bless you Lord, linger near when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand lest I fall. Take Precious Lord, lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired. draw with 
to take a few minutes before I preach, because you know i got to preach, just a minute, but I want to share some memories of Grandma. I was thinking about uh, some very early memories I had, but not too early, because I had a tendency as a baby, according to what I've been told, to uh, maybe have a little bit of a stubborn streak, have no idea where that came from, just popped out, but when I was upset, I would cry. And hold my breath until I passed out. And I remember Grand- Grandma calling me a little stinker and saying that she had no interest in babysitting me because of that. And that Mama could, could very well take me over to Bessie Mae's because Bessie Mae knew how to deal with that. So I didn't start staying at Grandma's too young because of that. But I think I grew out of that when I was, you know, 29 or 30, something like that. And uh, haven't done that in a while. But uh, I remember, you know... Grandma was so motherly and matronly. You went to her house, you were going to eat, you were going to drink. Didn't matter what she had, she could take, she might not have anything in the house. She might need to make a trip to to town because, you know, when you live on Yeller Mountain, you don't just bounce over to the grocery store, right? It was a trek to Franklin. Uh, it was a pilgrimage of sorts to get it to get to where there was a, a store to pick up anything. But she could take nothing and make something out of it and make you feel at home and make you feel welcome. And, uh, you know, the special memories, Stormy alluded to it, Christmas in particular. Grandma was, um, uh, you've seen these Christmas villages around the trees? Uh, no, she had a city. It wasn't the village, it was the city with, with the trains and the houses and the trees and the little mirror with snow sprayed on it that looked like a lake. And, you know, that was all well and good, but I couldn't pay attention to that because Grandma made, hands down, the best divinity, right, that's ever been then thought about in, in, in the history of the world. And uh, I possibly am a diabetic today. Because of those Christmases at Grandma's, I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, a couple pounds of divinity on Christmas Eve will help you sleep real well <laughs> waiting on Santa to arrive at your house. But uh, I, I, I remember being around there. Grandpa uh, was so handy. Uh, I wish that I had his talent, his gift of, of being a mechanic. He was, like I said, a simple man, and he was okay with that right? That's who he was. He was so comfortable in his skin, and I I appreciate that fact, but he was handy and, uh, you know, grew up on a farm, and probably the first tractor I ever drove was one that he built, you know, as as a four or five-year-old, and I love to spend time there um, and and hang out with Grandma and Grandpa and hear Grandma's stories and, uh, you know, chat with her, but as has been mentioned, um, Grandma's filter was broke, um, if it popped in here, it came out here. And, uh, you know, I-, I thought about it a lot. I don't think Grandma ever had the intention of being cruel or mean. I just think that disconnect was there. And, you know, I've heard her st- say stuff um, that, that I blushed, right? I was, like, totally uncomfortable. Um, I was trying to get out of the conversation and move away um, she just had a way about her, and, and I thought about a long time, you know, um, about who she was as a person, and, and, and here's what I want to say about that. She, she was a natural-born pessimist, right? Some people are like that. 
They, some people see everything positive. Some people see everything negative. Grandma's uh, experience was shaded by the difficult times that she had faced in her past. And, and so she was definitely... Uh, and I don't mean this disrespectfully. I, I'm painting a picture of who she was. She was a glass half empty kind of girl. But she had lived a hard life. But here's what I respect about that. Not ever one time did I ever even think that she had given up. She always, no matter how difficult it got, no matter what was going on around her, I always had the sense, hey, Grandma is going to keep on plugging. She's going to keep on going. She's going to keep on making it because she was that tough. Just like Stormy said, she was tough. And she always stayed after it. She had commitment. And she was so proud of her family. You know, I, I, I look and see y'all sitting here and, uh, um, and, and even us, I, spending time with her sometime at the rest home in particular, she always wanted everybody to know who you were. This is my grandson. These are my granddaughters. Aren't they pretty? Look at my daughters. This is what they do. This is what, she was so proud of us. The last time I was there, and I'm going to be honest because that's what I do. Um, after Grandma fell and was in bad shape, Hannah called me. I didn't go see her. And, and that was a selfish thing. I'm, I'm not going to lie. But the last time I saw Grandma, I went up there. She was, she was in, her mind was good. I sat down. I was able to love, love on her. I think Willine had maybe been there that day. Her hair was pretty. You know, she was dressed nicely. She felt good about herself. And I got to visit with her and hug on her neck. And when I got ready to leave, I stayed a little while. She walked me to the door. And the, lady, the, the nurses were fussing at her because she didn't have her walker. She says, I'm walking my grandson to the door, and I don't need that walker, she told him on the way by. She said, I'll be fine. And she walked to the door, and I probably talked to her five minutes at the door, and I had, just had some quality time. I got to spend some good, positive time with her, and, and I did not want to go see her hurting and suffering. I wanted to remember her that way because that's who she was. She was so proud of us. She loved us so much. When I think about Grandma's faith, now to the preaching part, if you don't mind, because uh, she, she would want us to, to talk about this. I never, as a, as a young child, remember thinking of grandma and grandpa as particularly religious. They didn't regularly attend service at that time. Uh, you know, they were here. They were part of the community. Another great thing about them, they didn't have piles and piles and piles of friends, but they had some good friends. To me, that's a, a good sign of good people. Their, their friends would go to the ends of the earth for them. And they would have done the same for their friends. People like Martha and Shorty and, and, and Ellie and Irene. I mean, it, was a, it wasn't a friendship. This was a lifelong family relationship. That's how they perceived it. And, um, you know, they had that, that part of the community. And uh, they all approached religion in a different way. I knew Grandma and Grandpa both knew about uh, Jesus, knew about the church, knew about faith. Um, and... and I didn't see a huge manifestation of that early in their life. And I got to tell you, there was a change, though. And, and we've talked about Grandma and we've talked about Grandpa. I got to take a moment and talk about the impact that my mother had on all, all of us when it comes to our faith. Um, after Mom died, Grandma approached her faith in a different manner, as have you, you guys. And I was thinking about that, and I don't know what happened, but I do know this. My mother um, laid on her deathbed encouraging and challenging and preaching to us, listen, with discernment under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, encouraging us on how we needed to live and, and go about our faith going forward without her. And, and I just got to think at some point that, that something she said to Grandma clicked because Grandma was different. Grandpa was different. Matter of fact, I don't remember hearing him talk about his personal faith until after Mom died. And he was very open about it that he had made a commitment. Very, just, just so Grandpa, very simplistic approach. He's like, hey, 
The Bible says it. I'm going to believe it, and that's good enough. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. You know, he just believed, took God at his word. But Grandma, you know, had, had uh, there was some depth. And, it, and to me, it changed that persona. She still lacked that filter sometimes, right? She still um, struggled with, with saying something positive about a bad situation. But there was not the depth of that bitterness and anger and hurt that you might have sensed on some level before. And here's what happened to Grandma. She made peace with God. And it got me thinking, listen, in a time like this, we need the peace of God. Paul wrote uh, to the Philippian church about the peace of God that passes understanding. And he said it will keep your hearts and minds. How? Through Christ Jesus. There came a point in Grandma's life. There came a point in my life. There came a point uh, in your life, if you've gotten here yet, that you found Jesus and you made peace with Him. You begin to understand, listen, I look around me at our society and I see a culture, a, a society, uh, a nation, a group of people who are trying to find that peace, that comfort, that solace, something to, to uh, um, settle that turmoil that's going on in our souls. And I'm here to tell you today what Grandma found out, what Grandpa found out, what I found out. Uh, is that there's only one answer to find that peace. And it's through Jesus Christ. It's through Jesus Christ. Grandma went from, and this is what happens. Listen, when, you're, um, when your natural tendency is to approach things with, with, with pessimism, then you tend to fixate on circumstances. And we all do that. I, I, I would call myself a natural optimist, but I have moments when I look at the circumstance or the situation in front of me and I find myself fixated on that and it causes me to have a negative approach because all I can see is a bad situation. But when I can step back and say, wait a minute now, I have committed my soul to the sovereign God of all the universe who's in control, not just today, not just tomorrow, not just next week, but forever and forever and forever, all the way into eternity that we can't even fathom, then the, the situation or the circumstance that I find in front of me at the moment is not as difficult as I would make it. If we're going to find peace in this life, we have to, listen, we have to make peace with God. The Bible tells us there's only one way to find peace, to be reconciled. Can I tell you today that each and every one of you were created by the God of heaven to fill a particular purpose on this earth? And the first and most important purpose that he made you for was to know him in a personal, intimate relationship. And that because of the sin that Adam and Eve has passed down to mankind, that we've inherited right on down, we're all born into sin, we are separated from that God. We're separated from that fellowship. We're separated from that communion by our sin, and there's only one answer for that sin. And it is the precious spilled blood of Jesus Christ that He willingly offered on the cross of Calvary for each and every person that's ever been born. And if you're trying to find peace another way, and there's so many people that are, you'll never find it. You'll never find it. You'll never find perfect peace outside of knowing Jesus Christ and being in the perfect will of a loving God who has your best interest at heart. Period. Period. And all these folks that are out here searching and looking and going all these different places and different things trying to find that comfort because you were made to serve God whether you know it or not. It's in there. There's a spot inside of you that can never be filled by anything else. 
There's a spot inside of you that will never find peace and satisfaction until you have said to him, I accept the sacrifice that Jesus made, and I want to be obedient to God above all else. That's when you'll find peace. And I don't care what you're doing, what your job is. You know, if you're important or not important, it doesn't matter. Until you find that spot, you'll never find that peace. We need peace. This world needs peace. Our country needs peace. And everybody's looking so hard to find it. Grandma found it, and it changed her. I found it. It changed me. My life is different. Listen, th there's nothing that I would rather do than honor my Savior. Now, God has blessed me. I mean, has blessed me abundantly. And there's so many things that I get to do, that I enjoy to do. But nothing matters to me as much as honoring Him. And listen, that is a place of peace. That's a place of security. That's a place of comfort. That no matter what the world throws at me, I've had some hard times. It hadn't all been easy. You've had hard times. It's not easy. Guess what? Even if we serve Him, you know what Jesus said? In this world, you'll have trouble. He said it. He said, you'll have trouble. But thank God He didn't stop there. He said, be of good cheer. But be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. See, all I need to know to have peace in my heart today is that Jesus is alive. That He lives here because I've invited Him. Listen, I recognized that my sin separated me from Him. You've got to come to that point. That's the crux. That, that is the, that's the tipping point. You've got to come to the place where you recognize that you are separated from the God of heaven by your sin. And that you can't be restored. You can't be reconciled. You can't be justified. You can't be made righteous until you accept the sacrifice that He made for you by faith and invite Him to live in your life. People, listen, all over this world say that Jesus was a historical figure who died 2,000 years ago. And I know that's false. You know why? Because He's alive right here. And you can't convince me otherwise because I know that my Jesus lives in my heart. And that's that place where we can find peace that passes understanding. We're going to need that peace in the coming days, the coming months, coming years. Beyond this circumstance, we need it. We need that peace in our lives. And I would encourage you today, um, examine where you're living. Examine what's important to you. Examine... Um, what motivates you and what makes you go. And if it's not pleasing to God, if it's not honoring Him, if it's not honoring the sacrifice that Jesus made so you can have real life, change it. Change it. We live in a day and time that I'm convinced that our Savior could show up on that eastern sky to rapture His church out of this world at any moment. At any moment. We know that I could leave here today and not make it a mile down the road and He called me home. Not promised tomorrow. And I've, I'm going to tell you, I've made a commitment in my heart. Anything that distracts me from the things that are important, that have eternal value, I don't want any part of it. I don't want any part of it. Because that's what matters. That's what matters. I want you to find peace. I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to let Him reign and rule in your life. And, and can I tell you this? And I'll close with this. I hesitated a long time as a, as a teenager. I was telling somebody last night, I was sitting right where Dad is. When as clear as day, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, Preach my word. Preach the gospel. I was 10 years old. I did not believe it was the timing. I was wrong. God knew what he was doing. But I spent, I wasted 10 years of my life trying to do my thing. And it's so silly, it's embarrassing. I wanted to play basketball instead of preach. And it's foolish today. Because if I could go back, I wouldn't trade everything I've experienced in between now and then for the opportunity to be obedient to the calling of God on my life. 
because there's nothing better. If God had, had called me to preach and to clean toilets, then there would be nothing better. He didn't. Thank God. I'm probably not very, very good at cleaning the toilet. I don't know. Hadn't cleaned a lot in my lifetime. I'm glad he didn't. But I would, listen, if God said you're to be the janitor at the Cashers Church of God, I'd be stepping down to become president of the United States if that's what he called me to be. And there's peace in that. Takes the responsibility off of me. I, listen, I enjoy my farming. That has created a, a fantastic opportunity for me to do a job that I love. I love it. And I'm called to do that. So it's, it's, it's precious. There's no pressure on me. I just say, okay, God, whatever you have for me, that's what I'm going to do. And there's satisfaction in that. There's happiness in that. There's joy in that. There's peace in that. We can find that in the center of his will. I encourage you today, if you haven't found that, even if you know him. Listen, I've known a lot of people that knew Jesus that didn't know how to make their life about what he wanted for them so that they could live in that kind of peace. I've seen lots of them. But the fact is, if you'll make that your focus, you'll never regret it. You won't trade it for anything. And I think that's what Grandma found in the last 20 years. And it changed, changed her life, changed her presentation, changed her outlook. And that's what I want. I want a positive outlook. No matter what happens, I want to know that I can make it because God's on my side. Would you stand? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let me thank you again so much for coming and being with us today, uh, celebrating Grandma's life. Special lady, special lady. Uh, and we're going to miss her, but we thank you for coming and being with us. Let's, let's ask God to bless us um, before we dismiss. Father, we love you today. We thank you, as always, God, for your blessings. Even in times of hardship and trial. Turmoil, God, in our lives. You're a good God. Your character, your nature, Father, uh, just, just demands that you continue to bless us and to love on us. And you do because your love is perfect. God, we need today and every day, but today in particular, we need that peace that you've promised your children, God. Help us to find it in you. Help us to stop looking anywhere, Father, else because it's all empty outside of you. But in Christ Jesus, we know there's completion, there's hope, there's restoration, there's fullness, God. There is that peace that we've talked about today. Be with us. Keep us safe, Father, going forward as we, we move over to the cemetery, Father. Be with us and bless us, Father. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.